what we're talking about is is secondary sex characteristics. Sport primarily, categorically, is concerned with secondary sex characteristics, which are, you know, musculoskeletal differences of, of any kind. Uh, We're doing it again. Yeah, yeah. Here we, here we are again, guys. Uh, we actually recorded this podcast like, what, two, three uh, four months? Four months ago. Four months ago yeah. now, yeah. And um, we had just got new equipment. Things didn't actually like pan out. So we had some really, really wonky audio coming in. And Miles was gracious enough to come back and uh reshoot this episode so just to you know as you can probably tell by the title of this we're going to be talking about trans athletes uh, we'll be talking about you know miles his athletic background his gym and stuff like that as well but um you know toward the end of this we'll kind of get into a lot more of the like a lot more of the issues around like trans athletes inclusion and kind of our take on it one thing i do want to preface this with is anybody's listening to this hoping that we're just going to bash on specific individuals or that there's going to be some level of bullying or transphobia or whatever you want to call it none of it's that i don't think either of us have an issue with people um i think we have concerns and qualms with how you know the various athletic commissions are handling this and the what is in my opinion kind of I suppose blindness with which they're handling a lot of this, kind of ignoring a lot of the science around it and stuff. Yeah, I think if if you if you want to engage this topic, the the real quest should be to do it in a non political fashion. Yeah. And as soon as we step out of, um, uh, I guess you could say, as soon as soon as we we leave the realm of science um, or philosophy and gender ideology. Um, and step into politics is where I'm, I'm officially out. I have, yeah. have no desire to uh, to play in that pond, per yeah, se. Absolutely. Yeah, so, uh, that being said, guys, we're just going to, I guess, just jump straight into, uh, you know, Miles, you've got, uh, I was talking about this on the last episode, so much of this is going to be kind of like a rehash of what people didn't actually end up hearing, but mm-hmm. you and I have kind of intersected in multiple points in our lives, but never really met until like less than a year ago. Yeah. Uh, I think we had like one really brief interaction at uh, at a coffee shop in downtown, and it was like, "Hey, hello, all right, see." You. And then we didn't see each other for like another year, and then that was when we actually like kind of talked and you know realized it's not like a few connections; it is so many connections between like music, athletics, uh, like people, church back in the day, and so well, back in the day for me, presently for you, um, like so many different things. Oh man, you had to throw that in. Now it's going to skew the whole podcast. It's, I, the thing is, I, I don't think so because on, on one hand, like you have like your religious background, but again, you're not bringing religion into this the same way that, you know, I'm, I'm bi and I'm not going to be bringing my sexuality into this. Like it doesn't, just because someone is or is not a certain way, I don't think that I don't think that's really all that relevant to the overall argument personally. Like, you know, there, there are certain things where it's like some people try and make the argument of you can't talk about certain things, but it's like right. you have to have everybody at the table yeah, because yeah, to and, some and, degree and every, everybody's impacted. Every, everyone's coming with, with certain presuppositions, no yeah. doubt. You can't, you can't divorce those things from, no. from who you, I mean, largely what we're talking about in, 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 in an identity construct is, yeah. you know, is who people are. Um, so certainly there's, there's presuppositions that, that I think everyone brings into this discussion. Um, but my professional obligation is to discuss this professionally for, yeah. uh, and specifically on, on scientific principles, yeah. um, which is how we, how we ended up here, uh, having this conversation in the yeah. first place. So obviously four, four months ago, um, we were, we were talking more theoretical, um, uh, post Olympics with, uh, Laurel Hubbard from New Zealand and kind of the emergence of, of Leah Thomas, uh, from UPenn and the swimming season getting started mm-hmm. and people bringing up the potential of, of Leah having a really successful season in the NCAAs. Um, now that that's happened and it's become a national conversation, um, I feel half bummed that we didn't get to have this conversation beforehand because it would have been one of the one of the first things that people probably would have found. Yeah, um, yeah. I, there weren't very many, many people discussing uh, Leah's case specifically at the time. But now I think that more people will be in tune um, to the conversation. They would have heard um, some of the more uh, political 
talking points of of this topic and hopefully they'll want to engage this critically respectfully um scientifically yeah. logically um just a little about me and and why uh, i guess why i'm having this conversation um we obviously are are this is a, a fitness podcast um we work with athletes uh, i own a company that that works with athletes we've got physical gyms but we're a coaching organization um, and we work in sports that tend to be uh, not your conventional field sports we have a, a, a high percentage of our client portfolio that comes from motor sports and then your traditional field sports as well um, and some individual uh, olympic sports so that's been across cycling alpine um, skiing snowboarding mm-hmm. um, but we've had a couple different scenarios where this issue has come up my academic background before sports performance um, as a career is is philosophy and ethics. Um, so I've had, I guess, the privilege of, of dabbling academically in this topic from a not just the, the physiology of my current profession, um, but thinking through really the last seven plus years of, of what uh, this particular issue where it finds itself in the social narrative um, and how to think through those things in terms of uh, human sexuality and behavior as a whole. It's been incredibly helpful to have that background in my coaching practice and in the development of Regulus as a business. Um, But then, you know, every once in a while you get kind of a I don't want to say a golden egg, but, you know, you get kind of a perfect scenario like this that that comes up and um, uh, it happens to be, it ha- happens to be a, a good intersection of, of different passions and, and things that I, I, I tend to care deeply about. Um, one of the things that obviously is is going to come up or that you see as a popular talking point is um, you are white cisgendered men speaking on this issue. Um, the identity of the individual speaking on it should really have no no bearing on on the the conversation, um, especially when, unfortunately, the people who this most uh, most significantly impacts are being pushed out of the conversation or being told that they can only have it one particular way. Um, so hopefully, this also is an invitation for um, for women, uh, females. However, uh, you want to think yeah. about that, um, which is another thing we need to probably discuss. Yeah, uh, terminology is also. So one, one other thing, guys, is um, we're going to do our best to have terminology correct here. But if there are slip ups, mistakes, accidents, please understand that that is what they are. There is no like yeah. bigotry behind what we're saying. Um it's tough to be perfect on these things. Like it just, it just is what it is. One other thing too, with like identity as a whole, the idea of like, you know, only certain people are allowed to talk on this. Um, I was having right after you and I shot that first episode and it didn't quite work out. I actually was having a conversation um, with somebody who uh, is non-binary, which um, they told me actually is uh, a version of being trans, which Mm -hmm. I didn't realize. Um, And, you know, we talked about Caitlyn Jenner specifically because Caitlyn has spoken out on this multiple times now and, you know, said, hey, like, you know, assigned female at birth transitioning to female or, or assigned, assigned male, male at yeah. birth, excuse me, um, transitioning to female does give them an unfair advantage. And I mean, you, you physically could not pick a better person to talk about this at one point, the most athletic person in the entire world mm-hmm. who went through this transition and people that I've talk to about it say well she can't talk about it because and it's there seems to always be a way to exclude people from the conversation unless you agree right which is frustrating right because um, obviously caitlin jenner was was the the champion of this cause for about half a decade yep. um i think woman of the year in 2015 16 mm-hmm. when it, my timeline may be off there um but uh, in a lot of ways, probably the not just the match, but the match and the kindling and the gas of uh, the current momentum that um, that trans people broadly, I think, have uh, in public discourse right now. So pushing her out on the grounds of her not aligning um, with the with maybe the the That's agenda per se. Um, 
not in a boogeyman sense, the yeah. agenda. Um, but that's that's really unfortunate. Um, and then, of course, the line is that, well, she's being transphobic, which is um, odd. Yeah. That so that was actually what one of the person said in that um, in that group or in that um, chat that I was in was they were like, well, it's transphobic, and it's like. I mean, just like at a fundamental level, that confuses me a little bit. Because yeah, I, I I struggle with with that as well. Um, not not what we're um, here to discuss or yeah. how to look at it, but um, it, there's also a uh, there's a there's a separate discussion to be had. Well, like you said, as someone who is who's non-binary as a form of of transgenderism, um, the the trans spectrum is is incredibly broad. You can ask. Uh, you know, 10 different trans people, what trans is, you're going to get 10 different answers. Um, and that uh, that's also important for this conversation because you're dealing with the metaphysics of gender. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're specifically... You may want to define metaphysics in this in this way for people. Yeah, yeah. So in, in this case, we're specifically talking about like the nature of being um, and, and how... Uh, in, in, in a broad sense, when I, when I'm, when I say the, the metaphysics of gender is like, what is the big question? What, what is gender? Um, and we have, then we have a, you know, a self ID, uh, as a, as a small portion of that, of that gender spectrum. Um, and then you have, you know, the folks that say I'm, you know, I'm born in the, in the wrong kind of body, which is in its own way, a, a metaphysical claim about a, a, a reality that's rooted in the individual, like a gendered soul yeah. of sorts. Um, and those are enormous questions that, that I think people are, are asking. Um, and they, they, they get there, they get into this conversation, but that's, that's not, uh, when, when we are looking at issues like Leah Thomas and, and sports performance, um, we're not trying to have those those debates, but unfortunately, um, it comes at the expense of of folks who maybe are identifying as as trans in a different way than what we are broadly speaking about here. Which more more so than not, it's the uh, it's the male to female transition, yeah. um, and then in compliance with you know whatever regulatory body or governing yeah. body's uh, guidelines for participation in sport. Yeah. The specifics of this. Our our uh, our participation in sport. Um, so the reality is that we're not we're not going to be able to cover every like possibility of gender expression and gender identity here. So for the for the most part, and you know we'll probably mention if it's going to be outside of this, but I think for the most part it is mostly in this case going to be assigned male at birth transitioning to female in athletics and just kind of how that is breaking down um, what people have said and you know what what we're now seeing as the reality of those people smoking in competition just absolutely destroying the majority of the time you know yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah I think probably where uh, where we start is um, maybe just a, a I guess backstory or context for for maybe those less familiar with the conversation and how it has uh, how it has arrived to where it is today and then maybe we we hop into some of the uh, the common arguments yeah. Um, yeah. the the in, in this particular case you know it's it's March. Um, we just had, or the NCAA swim uh, swimming national championships just occurred, and, and obviously the headlines were dominated by uh, Leah Thomas from UPenn. Uh, Leah is a uh, male to female um, identifying uh, trans individual who spent a number of years competing on the men's team, now uh, competing on the women's team, and is now uh, a a, uh, a national champion. That was uh, the the catalyst, obviously, for for a lot of questions around um, if it was fair um, and fairness as a whole is is something that we have to discuss. Um, but the the primary the the primary question that is being asked is uh, what is fairness um, and fair to who, um, according to who, and when we're when we're talking about sports specifically, the other principles that we really are concerned with is is fairness, safety, um, 
and inclusion, all, yeah. of, all of those things together. Uh, and uh, depending on the sport, how you, how you address those is, um, is, is nuanced, I guess. There's yeah. different ways. So like in, in, my, in my professional um, field, if you will, um, in like how, how we look at this in motorsports is slightly different than maybe how you look at it in combat sports, um, the way that you uh, weigh and measure each uh, each of those is is slightly different, but it's still a, a calculation of sorts that needs to be done. Every sport has different kinds of pieces of delineation, but one thing that seems to be consistent across almost every sport is a you know male and female category. Mm-hmm. So then it's yeah yeah um, yeah, and, and probably even that right like um, the the existence of of male and female um, categories in sport exist primarily because we are a dimorphic species. And so when we look at, and we talked about this in the last episode, when we look at primary sex characteristics, eggs, sperm, males, females, um, it deals with, with, with reproduction. Um, nobody, I don't think in their, in their right mind is, is arguing for a, a non dimorphic view of, of, uh, humans. Um, what we're talking about is, is secondary sex characteristics. Sport primarily, categorically, is concerned with secondary sex characteristics, which are, you know, musculoskeletal differences of, of any kind. But Your uh, heart size, your lungs, your limb length, all these different things that tend to contribute to greater athletic, you know, output. Yeah, your ability to run, jump. Your ability to recover. Punch. Recover. Oh God. Like if if you have higher testosterone levels, you can recover quicker. You're going to be able to train more frequently. Like yeah. that that in itself is such a big piece. I mean, not to like derail this too much, but I mean, there's a reason that people are able to train with way higher intensity when they start taking testosterone. You know, you yeah. are able to train more frequently. You are able to get see get greater growth. And and that's where um, something else that should probably be be noted about Leah is uh, Leah Thomas is is playing within the rules as the rules yeah. have been defined. Um, the, the NCAA is, is, to, uh, is to blame here. Yes. Um, and in large part, too, you have other governing bodies that are, that are largely responsible. The IOC, um, probably the, the biggest perpetrator of um, bad information and bad research and bad policy, especially on this topic. Um, but the testosterone itself uh, is of of little advantage um, it, when we're when we're talking about testosterone reduction in trans athletes. Um, the and it's obvious. I think everyone that's going to listen to this now will, will be up to speed with the fact that there are plenty of folks that are that are rightly saying um, that benefiting from uh, the androgynous effects of testosterone through development uh, is a is a an advantage that Leah possesses that uh, the counter her counterparts in the field do do not possess. Um, there's a, a handful of other sports that I think are, are um, important uh, examples of that in just presenting the fact that males and females, and this is not a, this is not a statement of value in, in, in any way, um, but males are much stronger than females. Um, in the quads alone, it's roughly 50%. In the upper body, it's roughly 90%. Um, in powerlifting, when you compare weight categories, it's roughly a 65% different between difference between males and females. Um, that's a that's a giant issue. Uh, I brought up the comparison in the last episode in running uh, that even though that's a much tighter margin, 10 to 12%, when you look at uh, at performance within certain events. The current 100 meter Olympic champion uh, Elaine Thompson, she runs the 100 meter in, in 10.85, um, it, that with the winning time, but holds the record at 10.61. And for comparison, that is still slower than the fastest 15 year old schoolboy, um, which is a, a, a massive uh, a, a, a massive difference there. When you so even with running, where the where it tends to be very very tight, um, that's a a, a big deal. Um, the the Michael Phelps fallacy is is really popular. Is in the Michael Phelps the Michael fallacy. Phelps fallacy. I, if, if we're talking about the same thing, I think that's yeah. what, it, um, that's, uh, what I'm calling it now. Is is what about Michael Phelps? Um, so anytime somebody wants to bring up Michael Phelps as a 
uh, as a, a the arguably the greatest swimmer of all time. His uh, long wingspan um, and uh, different aspects of his anatomy that that his his lungs being two times the average. And nobody wants to disqualify Michael Phelps um, because of uh, uh, because of because of those things is the argument that's made. Um, his his advantage in the hundred meter butterfly over the second fastest male at his best is 0.08 percent, but 13 percent over the best female. Um, so just a, a difference in, in the physiology and the ability between between Michael Phelps and um, and and his competitors, but also female uh, females in the same discipline or the same event rather. I find it fascinating that looking at high performing, um, looking at high performing individuals in uh, in certain sexed categories and sex affected sports, um, that that becomes an argument for the inclusion of trans athletes into uh, into um, that with their self identifying category. Yeah. That's troubling. Yeah. Well, and one other thing too, because the, uh, so that is the Michael Phelps file. That is exactly what I was thinking about. And there's a, one of the things that kind of like immediately dismantles that too, is the fact that there are like Michael Phelps is following the rules. He is, you know, not doing anything outside of the guidelines. And one other thing too, is that when you look at morphological changes in people in certain sports to a point, it stops having an impact, you know, all of the people, uh, who play, you know, at the highest level in the NBA, at some point your height stops being irrelevant. Like, yes, uh, you know, Michael Phelps' uh, wingspan and his lung capacity might be impacting it, but there are certain things like that where to a degree more does not necessarily uh, automatically mean better, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like there are certain morphological differences like that at the high level that don't matter, but when you take people from completely different ones where they have spent, uh, you know, decades in, in this case or in many cases, then it does start to change because you don't have something that is a little bit more. You have something that is in a completely different class. You know, you are, um, you know, significantly wider wingspan, significantly stronger bones, significantly, you know, pick whatever piece you would like. And that's where it tends to become a little bit more pronounced in trans athletes versus, you know, all male categories or all female categories where they all still have more or less that same baseline. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll provide citations and, or you can provide citations in the, in the show notes. There's a couple main, main papers that I think are, are exceptionally helpful in the conversation and, and people who are, who are helpful in the conversation. Um, Emma Hilton, primarily, she's um, just a phenomenal voice on this topic. She's a developmental biologist uh, at the University of Manchester um, and operates from a, uh, uh, from a, a, not just her, her developmental biology framework as a scientist, but she's also a, an, an outspoken feminist and speaks very, uh, very clearly on this topic and has conducted some phenomenal research. Um, they have a paper, um, her and uh, a, a colleague called Transgender Women in the Female Category of Sport Perspectives on Testosterone Suppression and Performance Advantage. Uh, that was published in 2020. Citation, though, is updated to 2021 because there have, there have been updates since. And then uh, John Pike uh, is from the philosophy department at the Open University, and he's consulted at WADA and on the IOC and with World Rugby on this topic and is also... Um, Probably one of the one of the I guess you could say leading thinkers uh, in approaching this critically and philosophically. So the blending of the two I've found to be very important for understanding how we approach the existence of gender identity categories, everything else. Um, but in 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 those or in the uh, in in the Hilton paper, the the Hilton Lundberg paper specifically, they they do an analysis of. Uh, of strength differences between, because we're specifically talking about testosterone now, as, as we, as you just briefly mentioned, and we'll bring it back to that. Um, te testosterone suppression as the as the metric by which we measure fairness or determine fairness is um, 
is just wildly inaccurate and, and grossly unscientific, um, even though it was grabbed from uh, from early regulations in sport. They kind of threw the 12 the month timestamp on it um, and then allowed participation on those grounds. But there's uh, just phenomenal data that was gathered in this on on retained advantage. So if there's a um, for the the corresponding loss in um, uh, in trans women of testosterone uh, and or an, an appropriate loss in testosterone, uh, it's corresponding performance loss, mm-hmm. and then this the difference between that performance loss and the uh, percentage of advantage that's retained over females is is pretty astonishing. So if a if there was a in most studies, it, it seems to be that there's about a 5% um, loss in performance mm-hmm. for trans women. Um, but for the majority, uh, the majority of the time, that still means there's anywhere from a 30 to 40% retained advantage over their female counterparts. Are you actually able to pull up uh, Leah Thomas's time, uh, like best time as, you know, pre-transition and then uh, current NCAA win? versus what her, um, you know, the person who came in second was? I know that might take a second. Because that would also be kind of an interesting piece to this. Of so, like, yeah, so she swam, a, um, and it's still uh, still slower than, like, Katie Ledecky um, and others. But, yeah, I can't, I can't see Leah's specific times uh well i mean a, a 418.72 in the 500 free um compared to uh the the 433 i think it was 433 in the championship round um which is which is a performance loss yeah but it's still which you would expect which you would expect yeah you would expect and that's that's even what i mean what the hilton paper points to in in this analysis here is roughly a five percent loss Mm. um but even then uh still enough to become a a national champion over over multiple female olympians um and so the the big the big thing being that even uh even even muscle mass is uh, largely resilient to a to a loss in testosterone. Yeah, and we know this from just general yeah, training. Yeah, exactly. Um, but even if you if you pair uh, if if you look at males to females and let's use let's use sprinting. So we already addressed sprinting. Males to females, um, there's that ten percent performance gap mm-hmm. that was ten to twelve percent, and that can. Uh, you know, some of that can is at times attributed to the difference in muscle mass between male and female, which can be up to fifty percent. Right. So even if there's a twenty-five to thirty percent decrease in muscle mass in trans women, uh, the 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 loss, the the muscle mass loss is actually only uh, is only five percent. Yeah. And the gap. Uh, if I can, if I can say this correctly, the the the, the performance gap then drops from ten percent to only eight point five percent. Which, if you are just on average, because we're dealing with averages, we're not we're not comparing the. It shouldn't be a, a comparison. Now we are dealing with a you know with uh, with one of the best in the country, yeah. but it should be about the what is the average advantage over right. average the average body of of females versus the average body of of males. Um, well, they they will maintain more muscle too, just because of like muscular hyperplasia. So that's I, I brought this up in the last episode, but someone like. Um, ben Pollock, for example, where he was, you know, a former pro bodybuilder, tried losing 100 pounds of muscle and literally could not lose that muscle despite his best efforts. There are there are certain things that are just going to be maintained, and the I don't know if you have this up already, but like the the IOC's requirements even for because I think I think they're trying to do their best to find. You know what are the pieces that we can control here that will allow you know this kind of trans inclusion i don't think that there is a way to do it personally at least not one that i've seen so far but you know the main thing that they're going for right now is like testosterone over 12 months and yeah if we're 
t- like even just that range, the uh, the upper end of it is like 280, I think. I've had male clients with testosterone lower than that. Yeah, and they're still obviously benefiting tremendously from that. Yes, because um, that's still you know yeah, upwards of like five to ten times an so, average female. So the, the the analysis in the in the Hilton and Lundberg paper is is mostly centered around 12 months. Um, even if you stretch that to 36 months, uh, that even and and the there's a Harper paper that I'll that I'll cite as well um, that concludes that. Even with the hormone therapy and the decrease in strength and lean body mass, um, the values remain significantly above cisgender women outside of even the 36 month time frame, um, which is like longer than than anyone is bound to right now. And like we said earlier, Leah's playing within the rules. The it's a yeah. Do, do all of them, are, all, all these athletes are playing within the rules right now. It's just the the rules still are coming with inherent advantages. And yeah. I think as more time goes by, we're only going to find that those advantages are more and more pronounced, not less. And I'm happy to eat my words. You know, if this like a year from now, it turns out I'm a complete idiot and totally wrong about that. Like I'll, I'll freaking call myself out for it. But yeah, yeah, I think, I think Laurel Hubbard, um, the New Zealand weightlifter is a, is a, a really good example of, of retained advantage as we're discussing it. Um, and, and everybody understands weightlifting. Like, like everyone gets that the, the weight weighs the same, the categories are the same. Um, and so understanding performance discrepancies is, is relatively easy. Um, and you don't have people making absurd arguments about hand size and foot size yeah. and, and whatever else. Um, but Hubbard, uh, for anyone who, who doesn't, uh, who doesn't know Laurel Hubbard is, a. uh, male to female, uh, Olympic weightlifter from New Zealand, um, trans athlete competed in the 2020 games and, uh, weightlifting as a, as a whole provides a good benchmark as a sport for, for male to female comparison. So on average, males are 30% stronger in each weight category. Um, and even if you take the strongest male in the smallest weight class, 69 in the 69 uh, kilo class, 151 pounds, he's still stronger than the strongest female to ever lift at 238 pounds. Um, so the, the smallest male stronger than the strongest female at, you know, to ever lift it at a, at a much, much bigger size as well. Um, and so Laurel Hubbard specifically is interesting because Laurel Hubbard is not just the first trans weightlifter in the Olympics, but is the oldest weightlifter in the female category in Olympic history. Um, okay. I didn't realize that actually. Yeah. So, and this is, this is fascinating. Um, Hubbard is 43 years old. The average age of, of a weightlifter in the Olympics is like 24 or 25. Um, so if you were to, if you look at a, there's a, a wonderful case study that is done on this is an age adjusted um, performance plot uh, for, for women and men based on, based on age where, where Hubbard, uh, where Hubbard, is when Hubbard is placed appropriately in in the master's age category for a 43 year old female, um, the winning margin is anywhere from 80 to 100 percent. Um, when the typical margins in in performance to to win in a weightlifting category is roughly nine to 15 percent. Mm. So anywhere, so Hubbard's dominating it at 80 to 100 percent, and that would literally be you know pick a weightlifter and them doubling the performance yeah, of, of exactly. their peers on the platform, which is just to, is, is absurd. Yes, right? absolutely. It's, it's absolutely. There's, there's absurd. like no explaining that away. The, the really fun, um, the, the really fun, uh, metric is what are the odds of that being a, just a, a, a statistically normal, performance for somebody right like um and it comes out to one in 2.8 billion the chances of laurel hubbard being that good and that dominant in an age in an age adjusted category is one in 2.8 billion so um that's uh uh 
st- wild because statistically she becomes the the best female weightlifter ever. ever. Yeah. Um, and to say that there's no retained male advantage there, especially at the age of 43 years old, is is utterly ab- absurd. Um, and I think that that's probably one of the clearest cases. And then obviously everyone wants to say, oh, well, uh, well, she didn't win yeah, at exactly. the Olympics, um, which we discussed last time. Yeah. And we said, well, someone will eventually. Yeah. And now Leah Thomas has, has done that. Yeah. Um, and so now the argument can't be made is, oh, well, well, Tra- well, look, tra- trans people yeah. aren't winning, so quit making a big deal about it. It's actually transphobia. Like, no, we're more concerned with, with the fairness of competition. Um, and especially when you come down, a lot, a lot of people try to only extend stricter rules to like combat or um, contact related sports like uh, rugby and football and, um, you know, fighting sports and stuff. And personally, I don't really, I understand that they're, their idea is like, oh, well, because people are getting hit, this matters more. But it's like, if you are beating out the competition, no pun intended, if you're, if you're beating the competition, um, it shouldn't matter whether you're physically putting your hands on, on someone else or if you're in a pool or weightlifting. If you have a retained performance advantage like this, and you know, a lot of people got really up in arms about the Fallon Fox situation, which um, for people who don't remember, because that was like a year or two ago at this point. Oh, it's been a while. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, basically a, you know, a former, um, you know, assigned male at birth uh, competitor, if I remember correctly, cracked the skull of a female opponent when they were fighting. Yeah. So, um, I, and we'll, we'll link this as well. It's a resource page um, from uh, one of, one of the leading proponents for, for inclusion. Um and it's on on pinkmantaray.com. And it's the pink manta, pink manta ray. Okay. Yeah, this is the the source. Um, another another uh, Ivy League trans athlete um, who's had a prominent voice in this for sure. I'll let you link it. And talk. I I think yeah. that it's it's fallacy laden and, and really really poorly argued. And so I don't want to lean on it um, or. Uh, uh, well, we could support even, it in a sense. If you but, want, we could go through a few of these like right now and, yeah, and kind this, of this kind. Of, I guess a, a problem that I have um, because the like the Fallon Fox thing mm-hmm. come or comes up, and and on the site here he goes. Whenever I talk about trans athletes, someone or many ones will unfailingly refer to Fallon Fox or quote that wrestler who broke some girl's skull, which often spreads sensationalized misinformation. Um, the distinction that he must make says, first of all, Fallon Fox is not a wrestler, but an MMA fighter. And then second, didn't break uh, her skull, but her orbital lobe. Um, so kind of moot points on both. Well, and then what I think is really frustrating is says um, is in this sport. And I want to I want to read this note because I think it's it's really fascinating um, that these are made up as as a prop and transphobic arguments. Um, Fox fractured Brent's orbital bone, which again uh, is actually quite common in MMA fighting because MMA fighting is dangerous and violent. Again, many cis women have also broken others orbital bones. Calling out Fox specifically is just transphobic. Um, The the issue here, and then also says, is everyone who participates risks getting injured and consents to this risk by participating. There are so many women that have spoken out from the combat sports world that say, we're not consenting to getting beat up by men. Yes. Um, we're consenting to fight other women. Yeah. Uh, and so if the argument that's being made in the combat sports sense on on this site here is, well, they consented to it, deal with it, yeah. um, is... A, a gross uh, injustice towards women. Um, Wasn't and Fallon Fox not open about the transitioning? Also, uh, am, I, am I misremembering that? I am. I am uh, not sure on the specifics of Fallon's coming out. Okay, um, but yeah, I do it's... know that Fallon has. I, I I follow Fallon Fox on Twitter and has on multiple occasions boasted about. Uh, <laughs> about her domination in certain fights. So, um, yeah, and is even said like, yeah, it felt good, you know. Oh, Jesus. Um, so, well, whatever. Uh, yeah. That is, um, it, every, the the combat sports thing should be should be obvious in, in having the yeah. the uh, fairness, safety, and inclusion conversation, and that's where uh, 
ultimately with, like I've said, is when, when you can't, there isn't a scenario where you can, where you can balance all three of those together. Um, and when you can't, uh, the 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 rights of women to safety um, should supersede uh, the rights of 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 trans individuals' right to inclusion. Um, it's a colliding rights issue, right? Like, yeah, is, it, it is, and that's that's another piece that comes up here is when you ask the majority of the women in these categories if they feel okay with it, most most of them are saying no, and a lot of people uh, who do support. Uh, you know, trans inclusion kind of just push that away where it's like, no, 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 it's not your turn to talk. Like this is about getting, you know, including them. And there are situations now where the, I I don't want to keep coming back to Leah, but you know, the person who did not compete into or in the NCAAs, I believe there's 16 people. So that means that there is a 17th person who didn't get to compete at the NCAA championships because Leah got in there. And that person, uh, I looked into it a little bit. It was actually their last year to compete. So their very last year, they were not able to compete because that spot ended up getting taken by someone who has yeah. performance advantages here. And the, the the argument there is that for the for the greater good of inclusion, someone's got to take the hit. Someone's got to take the hit. Yeah, right? which is um, which is nonsense. Yeah, um, it, I think in in exploring the the idea of inclusion um be, because i don't want to uh we well we can't even think about inclusion for trans people in sport unless we understand sport categories as a whole and why we have them yes um and it is an important distinction um sport specifically um i mean i i'm choosing my words very very carefully here because i want to be i want to be sensitive to uh to to trans people and this is in no way um we we have to just have a conversation about about <laughs> sexed bodies separate from from gender yeah um and i and it's not trying to other anyone or um or um you know discriminate in any way but uh female sports specifically exist um as a category to exclude males right it is a female space protected for females so that men cannot enter into those spaces Um, which is why even though all we see in the media is um, angry talking political voices which tend to be male dominated spaces um, the voices at the forefront of this conversation in sports science and in academia and in uh, the athletic community are women Um, and they are being silenced mostly by men who want to advance this form or concept of inclusion mm-hmm. um, that really is, is about bringing men into a women's uh, only space or right. what should be a women's only space. And even the, the idea of self-identifying as, as female when you are um, born male is dependent on the same categories that exist in sport to separate males and females. The the destruction of those categories effectively mean we undo um, years and years of female-led and female-fought-for progress yes. in society. And the, the shutting up of women... Um, who have long championed for their place in sport and society is one of the more troubling uh, bullying tactics that I see in 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 this. Uh, in, it becomes in, two protected classes butting heads, and one is not just likely to lose here; it is also going to trickle down and impact it in many other ways too. 
Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And the another one of the arguments that's been made is if it's not about, uh, you know, they'll say it's it's not about uh, it, it's it, it's not about protecting women's sports. It's it's about transphobia. Right. Mm-hmm. And just and keeping trans people out like, no, it is it, it is perfectly um, fine for me to sit here right now and say that I care deeply about protecting women's sports. Um, And then the, you know, the red herring is, is made that, well, if you care, if if it's about um, protected categories and and access to sports, then you would care about the fact that, um, that certain uh, socioeconomic groups don't have access to pools or winter sports or whatever it wouldn't be about it wouldn't be about women it's like well nobody's actively trying to tell those people that they can't yeah. um, they can't do those things so I want to go ahead and explain a red herring for people by the way yeah so basically just think it's of any time of argumentation yeah it's a it's a logical fallacy that that redirects the uh, the the conversation in a sense to something that that uh, it's can be more easily controlled, right? It seems related, but not quite. Yeah, so if you can, like in this case, right, like if you can make it to where you're not allowed to, all of a sudden your argument is is shut up um, or is made to, you have to shut up because uh, to to continue down your your line of reasoning is at the expense of mar- other marginalized people, right? You 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 look bad. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, so it's like you don't really care. It's kind of like a, you don't really care about the kids. Type, yeah, type yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it just it basically redirects it into something that seems related. It's not quite there, and it's it's basically like a really messy argumentative analogy almost to say you can't talk about that because blank. Or because you're not talking about this in this specific case. Yeah, in the, in this case, right? Um, but yeah, just any any time that there's a that there's a, a a false emphasis placed on on something that doesn't belong. Right. None of us are talking about access to winter sports or uh, or pools in in certain communities. We're we're talking about men entering in or. Self, assigned male self, at birth, self transitioning females, female, identifying yeah. and and participating in inside of a female space. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, if you've a, uh, do you, do you have anything more to say on that? Because that did just remind me of something as well. N- no, I th- well the we, I'm happy to come back to this. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the 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 closing point of that being that that gender identity is is completely irrelevant to to sports categories. Yes. Sports categories exist um, because we are a dimorphic species, and they and they exist for a reason, so that women can have a space for women that is not in any way, shape, or form uh, impacted by uh, male advantage. Yeah, there there was one person that I saw making the argument of, will people use this? to gain an advantage over competition. So like, will people maliciously abuse, you know, these kind of rough guidelines set forth by the, you know, various athletic uh, bodies and stuff out there? Um, Because there are certain things that will, you know, decrease your testosterone. So, you know, you decrease your testosterone to the level that they find acceptable. There are various medications that you can take that will temporarily suppress it so that you can pass different kinds of tests um, and show, hey, my testosterone is still low, and then essentially get off of that medication, continue training, continue to have that enhanced recovery due to the elevated testosterone levels, and then go back on that medication when you know you're gonna be getting tested again to show that your testosterone levels are still low. So in the case of transitioning male to female, right now, un- unless this changed very recently, right now there is no law that you need to, or no rule, um, that you need to have um, what is you know referred to as bottom surgery, which is essentially you know removal of the testes in the case of um, right. you know assigned male, which means that you still have the ability to produce higher testosterone levels. You are just suppressing it through medication in this case. So if you take or if you remove those medication from your daily regimen, your testosterone levels can come back up fairly quickly. And I, I believe the one that um, uh, that is being used by Leah is spiralactone or spiralactin. I can't remember what it is, but it has a very, very short period where it actually stays active in your system. So it do, like it has to be taken regularly to actually maintain, uh, you know, maintain that decrease in your testosterone. So is there even a possibility that people are going to see this? And you know, I'd hate to think that people are going to be shitty like this, but the reality is that 
when you're talking money and prestige, there are people who will abuse this system of, you know, hey, I, you know, identify this way, but I want to win yeah. a title. Yeah, and I'm not going to uh, one. I'm I'm not familiar with the pharmacokinetic effects of of what Lee is taking, um, or many other trans people for for that case. Um, two, I'm I'm not going to um, uh, speculate on the motive or intention of yeah. those that. And are, I'm not saying anybody is. Yes, um, just to clarify. I want to clarify that because yeah. um, it, there's obviously the oh well you're not afraid of. You're not afraid of, of trans people in women's sports. You're afraid of cisgendered men abuse. Like that's who the real perpetrator is. That's what ah, you see. How that's that, a fair point. See yeah, how that goes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Absolutely. There's going to be uh, there's going to be abuse. I think it's it, just behaviorally. Um, if you analyze the movement as a whole, and and I would have to go grab a um, a statistic on this or where it's from, but that uh, in a in a survey of of several thousand uh, trans identifying individuals, less than two percent um, plan on medically transitioning. They want to socially transition, oh. but two percent less than two percent plan on medically transitioning. So ninety eight percent of the of the of the trans population is going is going to socially transition, but not um, not medically. Uh, we'll toss the uh, the link for that as well in the description in case that number's not one hundred percent on. Yeah, and and it's not my intention to misrepresent that at all, um, or to question the legitimacy of the identity yeah. uh, involved there. But when we're talking about sport, we're talking even about a, a smaller demographic of of folks that are that are medically transitioning to some degree, and so if there's a if we can say with a fair amount of confidence that trans identifying people um, for whatever reasons may not all be uh, subscribing to mm. one particular medical journey per yeah. se right which is one of the one of the difficulties of of trying to come up with regulation that is inclusive because if it what if it is uh, what if it does become that there's a, a, a particular medical threshold that we're okay with yeah. um, that's not inclusive that's that'll that'll be exclusive and, and hard for for many people to access or achieve or however you want to look at that um, or if any if people even have the desire to yeah. but in sport it, it is it's it's competition it, it exists specifically for people to uh, battle if you will yeah, yeah. for superiority in yeah. one particular form of expression or another um, and so to to pretend like there will not be uh, abuses is is quite silly yeah um, and that's also the you know one of the problems with why we can't seem to get anybody, any governing body or any policy, to uh, rightly advocate for a you know a a, a trans category, a, a trans category yeah. or or another category, um, but which again is why, as long as this is about the 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 place of. Um, of trans people within society and not about sport, it won't get to be advanced on scientific principles. Right. Because a trans category, which would allow for um, trans identifying people to compete mm -hmm. in, in, a cat in sport, um, it is a, an other category than where they are self-identifying, which tells us that it is still the most important principle here is um, recognition of one's self-expression right and sport just doesn't care yeah it's like and not saying that people in sports don't care because we do care about uh, about people um and are sensitive to 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 people. to var to varying yeah. identities uh within the human experience yeah um but th the categories exist so that we can have sport, exactly. um, so that we can compete, yeah. so that men can compete against men and women can compete against women. Yeah, there are limitations. There are rules on these things for a reason. Like yeah. it, it's it's there so that we can see, plain and simple, like who is the best at this within given parameters. 
Right. And the so on that Michael Phelps discussion from earlier, like this sport exists to find statistical outliers in performance, right? Like you you're you're looking for the things that makes Michael Phelps in in a category of his male peers, what makes him superior. You can't uh, you can't take a single attribute of Michael Phelps and say it's his lungs or it's his arms or, or it's, it's his, his testosterone. Or it's whatever, um, and say that's the reason why, which is why you can't form policy around a single metric like testosterone Correct. and say this is the standard by which we will justify um, inclusion in the sport. Man, this has been such a hard conversation to have. Yeah, like there's... not Not like literally hard. I just mean finding ways to talk about this in a way that is acceptable while still talking about the reality of this situation. Yeah, it is beyond eggshelly feeling, you know. Yeah, totally. Um, and you've got uh, you've got daughters, correct? I have what? You have daughters? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, this is something that we talked about on um on the last podcast. But you know, like I have like nieces um who will realistically face this in their schooling, and it is um. And this is where it kind of gets into the more like emotional aspect. But I mean, it's it's strange for me to think about um, my nieces not being able to compete or being beaten by somebody who is assigned male at birth, um, because we start we've started seeing that kind of stuff in school now as mm-hmm. well. And um, so much of this keeps coming back to I don't know how this is going to get handled. I don't know who's going to handle this. I don't know what the right answer is here. And I think that's what makes this such a fucking messy. Yeah. Topic. Yeah, I um and I don't want to I don't, don't want to go down the yeah, emotional rabbit I hole. I don't want to have the the you know the the boogeyman yeah. thought of, you know, oh well, I've got daughters and that justifies my my opinion. It, it, it's me having daughters is irrelevant to how mm-hmm. I feel about this because it's about the physiology yeah. um and the logic. Uh but what I think is is and probably one of the reasons why I do why I do also care more about it is it has important implications for other spheres of society. Um, it has important implications in healthcare. Um, it has important implications in our criminal justice system and the prisons. Um, mm. It has it, like and and other places where um, sexuality, sexual this just activity, comes down to identity as a whole um, outside of sport. Yeah, it, there's yeah. It, it 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 trickles down and yeah, and. The what we apply in one sphere will inevitably bleed over into yes. into another. Um, so it's not just that, like you know, for a lot n- of the people who might be doubting that. By the way, that's how a lot of law works. Is there there are situations where um, you know one um, one case will be referenced as the reason for the outcome of another case because oh this was already determined in law. So that's not even like a far fetched statement. Yeah, it sets precedent, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not like that. I I worry just for my my daughter's ability to have. No, of course not. It, but yeah. how many other spaces um, are women going to uh, maybe lose uh, lose the right to um, or not have as an exclusive space? Um, and again, that's a, a different conversation for. Um, gender identity as a whole yeah. but i think that this honestly um it, it it throws a difficult wrench into a already very messy fast spinning wheel um that in the last 10 years has has uh, evolved into a level of complexity that is largely incoherent um that's where even starting this conversation off and trying to say hey no disrespect in yeah. in in the right usage here but you know in it, it's hard to define your terms it's hard to even know how to how to navigate uh the the language to, yeah. to even get started so um my hope is that by by showing um and i and i'd encourage people that if you if you maybe um one two things i'd say here one if you if you agree with with the position um 
that that I'm advocating for here, and I and I think Andrew obviously is yeah. is agreeing with, um, is that you won't get anywhere having this conversation with people if you do not um, work to acknowledge the humanity and the dignity of those who um, are in the middle of this. Like Leah Thomas is still a person, yeah. and it's important. Still a person. Still a person. person. It's important to to recognize that and behave accordingly. Um, secondly, if you are on the, say, opposite side of this, of inclusion at all costs, um, that you would not um, belligerently scream and yell and throw a fit at people like myself or Andrew who are addressing this from this position that you would approach this charitably and understand that we actually do care and it's possible for us to care about issues involving trans people well, without being without being transphobic or misogynistic or bigoted or whatever other slur wants to be used to push somebody out of a conversation. Um, that's deeply problematic for, for this area. Um, and that's why I say like it has implications across other spheres um, because they, we unfortunately aren't getting to address, we don't have the luxury of just addressing the performance physiology yeah. of, um, of males and females. Unfortunately, we have to we have to look at this uh, in a much more broad sense. Um, Seeing how just this conversation like branches out to so many different things is is crazy too. Because even just since you've said you know how is this going to impact all these other areas, I've like started thinking about that in kind of a way I haven't really considered either. Because it really does not just it doesn't yeah. just stop at sports. Yeah, and it, and it it's not that it um, you know I think the the other arguments that are commonly made is like why do you care? It doesn't it doesn't impact you, um, but it does change the way that we can coherently think about other topics, yep. and it matters because we're all trying to exist in this world, yeah. um, and being able to uh, to understand various aspects of the human experience and human Always identity to get through this shit man it's really is really <laughs> tough so um yeah i i hope that people will um you know maybe take the time to to engage with with folks that uh disagree on this um and do so in a way that is respectful and charitable and um assume the best of those that you disagree with approach it from a you know a principle of of mm -hmm. charity and and respect and um, one other, and unless you have anything else, I no, um, no we could we could go all anybody day, but... I know, dude, but it's will end up going in circles. Yeah. <laughs> um, if anybody does actually want to hop in on this conversation, because um, I did actually invite somebody to you know who is non-binary and they declined. Um, if anybody wants to have this conversation, I'm more than happy to. I don't know about you, but I know you're totally, happy to have the yeah. yeah I know yeah. you're happy to have the conversation in general. Um, I think we'd be fine doing another episode about this to, you know, to have a voice that's a little bit more directly, um, you know, in that space. Um, I think it only makes the conversation better, you know, to to get from the other side and um, to be able to to be able to hear things that you and I maybe can't even conceptualize in this case. And um, so, if anybody is open to that, you know. You can find me pretty much anywhere at Andrew PFM or on YouTube. And then, um, Miles, if they're trying to find you. Uh, Instagram at Miles Brazil. Uh, Twitter at Miles of Musings. Um, and I, I tend to uh, have more of my personal life on Instagram and more of my uh, professional engagement on Twitter. But who's on Twitter anymore? Who are we yeah, kidding? Sorry. yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Alrighty, well, uh, if that's all that, I think that's all. Thanks for having right, me on, guys. Yeah, no, dude. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for coming back on to reshoot this because I know it's a, uh, you know, it wasn't just an hour out of your day. In this case, it was, you know, two hours plus the commute all around and stuff like that. So all I appreciate good. it. Yep. Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Alrighty, Miles, appreciate your time. And uh, until next time, guys. I'm Andrew with Pride. We'll see you later. <laughs>